Hello everyone! We've been looking a lot at chromosomes and how chromosomes can be duplicated and passed down um, through these certain types of cell division that we focused on in the last module. What we're going to do now is extend that idea. So considering the fact that chromosomes can be inherited, this ends up leading to um, the, the, the outcome or the consequence is the fact that certain traits can be inherited. So we're gonna be learning about um, these basic rules of how genetic traits are passed on from one generation to the next. And let's just start with some basic definitions here for genetics and heredity. So when we talk about heredity, this word, this is referring to the fact that traits can be passed on from one generation to the next. So let me just actually write this down. We'll get a basic definition going. Um, heredity, we might say that this is the transmission of traits. Transmission of traits from one generation to the next. So for example, you might inherit a certain color of hair uh, from your parents or a certain color, eye color, for example. Those would be um, specific traits that you might inherit. And then genetics over here, what this word means um, this has a definition that that is pretty specific. Genetics is the scientific study of heredity. So genetics means that we're going to be applying the scientific method um, to this study of how things get inherited. So the scientific study of, in, of heredity, we'll just say. Okay, so where this field came from, or rather the person who really got the field of genetics underway, is Gregor Mendel. Gregor Mendel. And Gregor Mendel is known as the father of modern genetics. He did a lot of the really, um, really foundational experiments that got some of our basic concepts um, of genetics down for us. Mendel lived in Austria. He did his experiments in the 1800s, and a lot of his experiments uh, were based on pea plants. So we'll be looking at a few of the experiments that he performed. Um, why pea plants? Well, pea plants are really easy to grow. They come in um, they come in different varieties that can be easily easily distinguished from each other just visually. Like you can tell whether a pea plant makes um, for example, flowers with, with, that are purple in color or that are white in color. It's really easy to just, at a quick glance, see the difference between, between those different varieties. Um, it's also really easy to control their reproduction. And to explain that a little bit, let's just look at a picture of a pea plant flower here. Okay, so this is a pea plant flower. And what, uh, what is being shown here is kind of a cutaway. So there are some petals that have been cut away partially. Let me get my laser pointer. We can see these petals up here. There are also some more petals that kind of would ordinarily wrap around all of these structures. And what these structures are, there are two really distinctive structures. There's the one right in the middle. This is called the carpal. This is a structure where meiosis is happening in order to produce eggs. And then there are also these other structures off to the sides. These are called the stamens. And in the stamens, meiosis is taking place as well, but in order to produce sperm. So we have both egg cells and sperm cells being produced within the same plant. And a lot of times, because these, because these structures are all enclosed normally within the petals, um, ordinarily with pea plants, they self-fertilize, so the pollen from the stamen, the pollen would just kind of drift over to this carpal and end up fertilizing the egg cell that is down here. And um, so that's called self-fertilization. Um, I was mentioning that it's easy to control the reproduction of pea plants. So in terms of doing experiments with pea plants, it's really easy to just, let me move on to the next slide here. It's really easy to cross different varieties of pea plants and to do that, you can just use a paintbrush, literally brush off some of the pollen from one plant and then literally apply it to the carpal of another plant. So that's um, intentionally crossing this plant with this one. So that's easy to do. Um, this allows a lot of different really specific experiments to be performed. And then what we can do is look at the offspring of that cross and see the different traits that are exhibited in them. So some of the traits that Mendel looked at specifically 
are shown here on this slide. Um, he investigated the color of the flowers, so whether the flowers were, for example, purple versus white. He discovered through his experiments, he discovered that white is the recessive um, trait, purple is dominant. So we'll come back to that a little bit later on. He also looked at just the position of the flowers. Are they at the, at the ends of the stalks or are they midway down? Um, he looked at the seeds. What color are the seeds? And also what texture or shape do the seeds have? They could either be smooth and round or they could be kind of shriveled up and wrinkly like this. And then a few others, um, some details about the pods and also just how tall the plants are. What are the length of the stems? So anyway, he did a lot of experiments based around these traits. And depending on the crosses that he did, um, he made interpretations based on the outcomes of those crosses. He had four major hypotheses that he investigated. So we'll just go ahead and list them out here and make a couple of notes as we go. Hypothesis number one, he supposed or hypothesized that there are alternative versions of genes that can account for the variations in inherited characters. That sounds like a mouthful, um, but what he was really saying is that there are different versions of genes and that ends up leading to these different features like some plants have purple flowers, others have white flowers. Those are different variations in a particular inherited character. Um, the alternative versions, let me get my pen here. The alternative versions of genes, there's a name for that. Alternative versions of genes are called alleles. We'll be using that word quite a bit going forward. So alleles. Let's go ahead and look at the second hypothesis that he had. For each inherited character, an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. And that goes along with what we've already learned, right? In the past chapter, when we were thinking about chromosomes, we, we considered this fact that organisms inherit a copy from mom and a copy from dad. Um, a couple of words to, to just get down right here. If an organism has two identical alleles for a gene, so in other words, if you inherit, um, for example, an allele from your mom that encodes brown hair color, and if you also inherit an allele from your dad that encodes brown hair color, okay, so you got two of the same variety, two, uh, two identical alleles, then what we would say is that you are homozygous for that particular trait. So this word homozygous, homozygous, uh, means that we're talking about identical alleles, identical alleles versus the other possibility is if we get two different versions, so two different alleles. In that case, we would say um, heterozygous is the word that would apply there. Heterozygous. This would mean different alleles are present in the same organism different alleles. Hypothesis number three. If two alleles of an inherited pair differ, so in other words, if, if it's a heterozygous situation, um, then the appearance of the organism is dictated by the dominant allele. And um, the other allele just kind of hangs out in the background. It doesn't have any noticeable effects on appearance. So we say that it's recessive. In order to represent the difference between these dominant versus recessive, we use uppercase letters to re represent dominant alleles. Whoops. Dominant. It's represented with uppercase letters. Um, whereas recessive, recessive alleles are represented with lowercase letters. So for example, um, a heterozygous individual, if we're talking about a, uh, an individual who is heterozygous for a particular trait, or if we're talking about a pea plant that's heterozygous for, for a particular trait like flower color, uh, what we would do is use letters to represent that fact. Heterozygous would be represented um, like so, capital P, lowercase p. So two alleles being represented, and this is just illustrating the fact that one of the alleles is dominant, so capital, and the other is recessive. 
that dominant allele is what dictates the appearance of, for example, the pea plant color. Um, so the flowers in this case would be purple, not white, even though there is an allele present for, for white. That's a recessive trait, so we don't actually see it in the appearance of the organism. Fourth hypothesis, a sperm or egg carries only one allele for each inherited character, and that's because the two alleles get separated during meiosis. We've learned about meiosis already, so we can kind of take the shortcut there and, and just think back to that. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Gametes, such as sperm and eggs, only get one copy of each allele. This whole statement, this whole hypothesis about the separation of alleles, um, this is actually called the law of segregation. And then when a sperm and egg unite at fertilization, um, each one contributes its alleles, so that, that restores the paired condition in the offspring. The offspring will be diploid. We can take a look at an example of this, the law of segregation. So let's just start up at the top. We're looking at a cross between two uh, pea plants. One produces purple flowers, the other produces white flowers. And so in terms of representing the alleles that are present, um, we're just going to suppose that we start with pure breeding flowers. So this one is coming from a long line of purple flowers. All of its alleles are going to be the same. So two capital P's to represent its alleles. And then for the white flower plant, um, we're assuming that it is also purebred. So it's come from a long line of white flowers. Doesn't have any other type of allele present other than the, the one that encodes for, for white flowers. So two lower case peas right there and then when each of these plants undergoes meiosis all of the gametes will be um, just with a single allele so here's here's representing the gametes from the white flowers here's representing gametes from the purple flowers okay so law of segregation right the the alleles just to sort independently and then at fertilization those two gametes will combine in order to produce the offspring. We call the original plants up here, these are the parent plants, we call this the P generation, P for parent. And then the offspring of this cross, we call it the F1 generation. This F comes from the word filial. Um, this is the F1 generation. And then if we were to look at like the grandkids, that would be the F2 generation. Um, and then if we could keep going for as many generations as we want to, but this is pretty standard notation to start with P and then look at F1. So the F1 generation, these plants, these are called hybrids. They are a cross between these two different strains. So this is no longer a purebred plant, it's a hybrid. And its genotype is this right here. We've got a capital P allele and a lowercase p allele. And when this plant undergoes meiosis, its gametes are gonna have the same uh, same kind of idea. The alleles are going to separate. Each gamete will get only one allele. So this is where it gets kind of interesting because this purple plant, it can either produce gametes that have capital P or it can produce gametes that have lowercase p. So that's the law of segregation just kind of being illustrated right there. The fact that these alleles separate from each other during meiosis. Next up, what we can do is consider a cross between two of these plants, two of these F1 plants. And to do that, we like to use a Punnett square. That's what's being shown right down here at the bottom. In this Punnett square, what we do is we represent the gametes from one parent over here on this side and the gametes from the other parent over here on this side. So in this case, since we're talking about two of the same type of plant, two F1 plants, um, it turns out that their gametes are, are the same, uh, and that's fine. So we just take this P, put it right there, this lowercase p, put it right there. And same thing over on this side. Um, gametes from another plant go over here. The cross then, the cross between those plants is illustrated by the outcome in these boxes. So what we do is just look at the intersection. This capital P combined with this capital P gives us uh, capital P, capital P. This is homozygous, homozygous for flower color. And specifically, it's homozygous dominant because it's the dominant flower color that's present. Over in this box, we're combining lowercase p with uppercase p. 
And so this is a heterozygote. The appearance of the flowers is dictated by the dominant allele. So these flowers are going to look purple because that dominant allele is present. There is an allele for white a flower color, but it's recessive. So it just hangs out in the background. That's a heterozygote. Same thing here, another heter heterozygous plant. Um, for flower color. And finally, last possible combo is if we get this lowercase p and this lowercase p. That gives us a homozygous recessive plant. So in the end, what we can do with this Punnett square, this is showing us all of the possible outcomes of the cross that we were considering. And we can see that there are four possible outcomes, right? Um, three of them have purple flower color. One has white flower color. So we like to talk about um, phenotype versus genotype. Phenotype is how something looks. Genotype is referring to what genes, what alleles are actually present in the genotype. So the phenotypic ratio is three to one, right? Three look purple, one looks white. The genotypic ratio is a little bit different. We look at the specific genotypes. There's only one that's homozygous dominant. There are two that are heterozygous and there's one that's homozygous recessive. So the genotypic ratio is one to two to one.